Number one, fishing. This is the only major food producing sector that still relies on hunting and trapping. There's over 30,000 species of fish. FAO gets reports on about 5,000 of those. There's um, many more genetically differentiated stocks that we know very little about. Aquaculture. This has now become the fastest growing food production sector in the world. There's about 500 species that are farmed. Again, there's many, there's a few more domesticated strains, but really very, very few. Um, if we look at the big picture, we have over 30,000 species of fin fish, over 80,000 species of mollusks, it's crab, sorry, clams and uh, oysters, almost 50,000 species of crustaceans, lobsters and shrimp, over 13,000 species of seaweed and other aquatic plants. Um, very few of those are actually farmed. Um, so, in the, in the biodiversity count, um, we win. We really use a lot of different phyla uh, kingdoms. We have, we have production from two kingdoms. Um, this is just a picture of how it's kind of broken down in, in fishing and fish farming. Most of the production comes from fish. Um, for the most recent year, we have data on, we get over 168 million metric tons of, of produce from the world's oceans and seas and rivers and lakes. Uh, as I said, it's pretty diverse with mammals, amphibians, crustaceans, aquatic plants. From the marine sector, we get about 30% of the production turned into animal feed for fish farming and for um, livestock. In the so when you take that away from the captured fisheries sector, we have about an equal number of, of fish coming that, that are consumed by humans, an equal number coming from the captured fisheries and from fish farming. And that's kind of what this graph here shows. The top line is the world's major marine captured fisheries. The, the bottom blue line is the production from aquaculture. Now, with better management of our captured fisheries, we're going to get a little bit more food, but basically this trajectory is going to stay about the same. And the same with aquaculture. That trajectory is probably going to stay about the same. So very soon, over half of the fish that you consume will come from farms. Now, what's driving our sectors and what's driving the impacts on biodiversity. Well, for marine fisheries, this is certainly fishing pressure. The biggest thing we can do is reduce the number of fishermen in the world and we would help manage those, those marine fish stocks better. For inland fisheries, it's quite different. It's habitat loss and habitat degradation. These are impacts that come from without, outside of the sector. For aquaculture, it's market demand and sustainability issues. And as you saw from the previous slide, there is an ever-increasing role of aquaculture and how this is going to affect the world's um, aquatic ecosystems is a question. So now, how do we use our genetic resources? This, um, the upper left-hand part of the slide here is California. Now this state would be about the world's seventh or eighth largest economy if it were a country. And all the funny blue lines are rivers and it turns out that salmon are genetically differentiated by those rivers. But the salmon are fished out in that, uh, yeah, in that big blue dot out in the ocean and you can't really tell where they come from. It turns out you can manage that mixed ocean fishery much better when you look at the genetic stock and where those stocks are coming from. We can also use stock enhancement, the lower, the, um, the lower left hand slide. We can collect fish from natural river systems. We can breed them in hatcheries, we can raise them up again, and we can stock them back out into modified ecosystems or into natural ecosystems. We can follow a variety of genetic protocols where we can match 
the wild stock very well, or we can make that stock completely different from the, from the wild stock. Introduced species. Aquaculture is the number one reason for the deliberate movement of aquatic species around the world. And this picture in the upper right shows a, a Chinese woman selling an African fish. There's much more of this tilapia, uh, African cichlid, farmed in Asia than there is in Africa. And then, of course, we, we have some rare cases of domestication in the fisheries sector, and this is the common carp, the first species domesticated. And this was done several thousand years ago. It was moved around the world by, by Romans and monks. Um, it shows what you can do with a breeding program, but up till now, we really haven't taken advantage of this. We also have ecosystem services that we've heard a lot about, nutrient cycling, the movement of fish between the ocean and fresh water, this connects these two vastly different environments. The trees and the fish and the bushes and the birds you see in this picture, a high percentage of the nitrogen in their systems come from salmon that have, that have gone to the ocean and then come back. We can also improve habitats through um, um, oyster and shellfish culture. These bivalves filter water, and actually in, in nature they have a very um, useful cleansing function, and also in, in oyster farms you can enhance that cleansing function. Disease and disaster resistance, allelic diversity in fish is one of the main um, reasons for disease resistance. And these natural ecosystems that you see here, they provide a tremendous resistance to and resilience uh, on impacts from shocks such as climate change. And I, I can't miss this opportunity to say that the high-level panel of experts um, actually missed this sector completely in their examination of how to adapt and mitigate to climate change. Now, a lot of this is at the species level. We have very poor information at the genetic level of these ecosystem services. Again, on sustainability, if we look at this, uh, we've heard a lot about uh, the marine fisheries. This top line is uh, the percentage of marine fish stocks that are uh, fully fished and stable. That's about 50% of the stocks. That's, about, that's a good thing, and that's staying, that's staying stable over the last several years. Um, the next line is, these are moderately or underfish stocks, and those are decreasing. That's not such a good thing. The, the bottom line that is rising is, these are the overfished, depleted, or recovering stocks, and over the last several decades, that has been increasing, and that's not a good thing. More information on sustainability. The demand for seafood is going to increase. Everybody pretty much agrees with this. And to meet that demand, we need about 2% growth a year. If we put every fish in a traditional breeding program, we could probably get 5% gain a year. So that's all we have to do. Just start managing our genetic resources better. We don't need much more food. We don't need much more land. And we don't need much more water. As I said, aquaculture is the main reason for the deliberate introduction, and uh, this will certainly continue. Most, the vast majority of these introductions have not caused any significant environmental impact, and they have produced tremendous socio and economic impact, but a few have caused some real disasters. Information gaps. The genetic structure of most of these wild populations is still very poorly known. Over 50% of the production reported to FAO from inland fisheries is not identified to species. It's just saying, yeah, we get something from our waters. Over 50%. We still have very poor capacity and knowledge of breeding programs. This uh, slide in the lower right shows the tremendous gains that have been made in the other sectors. And we're starting to make gains in fish production. Uh, primarily started through carp and salmon. Now we're looking at tropical species and how to improve them better as well. Better information on aquatic genetic resources. Certainly we need this. And the reason we need it is we have to, and I'll just start at the far, uh, let's see, yeah. We'll just start at the far left. Um, we can now identify fillets of fish. We can identify shark fins. 
through genetic characterization. We can tell if a stock is an inshore stock or an offshore stock. We can tell if a fish is escaped from a fish farm or if it's a wild, if it's a wild relative. And once we start looking at this genetic, uh, at the genetic level, we get some surprises. And especially in regards to traceability, there's a study that shows in very upscale markets in uh, New York, Paris, Canada, about 20 to 30 percent of the seafood is mislabeled. So you may be paying for scallops, but you may be eating skate. And the other thing that we find out when we look a little deeper is that actually cows are more related to dolphins than they are to horses. So uh, that's, I think I'll leave with you laughing. Thank you very much.